Happy Father's Day. I'm Pastor Harv. Great to be here in the house with you. My family is getting ever so closer more, uh, to moving here to Idaho. Lord willing, we'll be here full time next month. So thank you for having us. Yeah, we're excited. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're in FH Strong, and FH Strong is about how to find strength in the midst of difficulty, how we find power in the midst of, of life when it goes wrong. How do we find the strength of God to resource our lives so that when we face life, we can do so with great strength? Our theme verse has been John chapter 16, verse 33. It's up here on the screen. Follow along with me. I have told you these things so that in me, Jesus saying, you may have peace. In Jesus, we have redemption. And in Jesus, we have peace. It's in him, finding it in a relationship with him. In this world, you will have trouble. Good Lord knows we have plenty of trouble going on in our world today. Difficulty after difficulty. It's sort of like we go from COVID-19 to a world on fire even more than it was before. Where do we find peace in the struggle? We find peace in Jesus Christ. That's where we do. And it says here, but take heart. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Pastor Doug gave us the first two steps of what it looks like to be followers of Jesus and having a strong faith. The first strong faith was that we would choose courage. It literally is a choice. Courageousness is not for people who wake up someday and go, I'm going to be courageous. It's for people who say, I can be courageous because God is in me. He's given me the strength to face my adversities and to face difficulty. The second one is, is that God comes in and he says, hey, hey, you'll be stronger when you sharpen your character. Loose character will destroy our lives. Sharpened character will build our lives. Today, we're gonna talk about the next one, and that is how can we experience God's power directly in our lives when we face difficulty? The verses for this morning are up here on the screen. They're found here in Ephesians chapter one, verses 18 to 20. The Apostle Paul praying out over his church in the same way that I'm praying this over you this morning is I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope, not just think about a hope, but that we would know the hope. There's a difference there. Later on here in a minute, I'm going to talk about this. We've talked about the distance between our hearts and our heads. Today, we're going to talk about the distance bef- between our ears and our eyes, the difference between hearing about God and seeing him for ourselves. That's this morning. We have hope, which he has called us to, the riches of this glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for those who believe. Christianity is not made for weakness. It's made to address our weakness, but we're not called to be weak. In fact, we're called and empowered to be strong in the Lord. And being strong in the Lord means that we love him and that he empowers us. Do you know a person in your life that you know directly that when you're with them, you feel stronger, you feel like we could do anything? I'm not talking about that friend at 17 years old when you did that stupid thing you'd like to forget. I'm talking about when we're with someone in our lives that we go, you know what? We can do this. That's the work of God in our lives. Now to get to that place, our eyes have to be opened. And the way that we have to have our eyes open first is that we see that God demonstrated, if you're following on the notes on the app, by the way, that God demonstrated his power to us. First of all, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was in Israel earlier this year. I've been to the resurrection. I can see friends that we've been there to the place where Jesus Christ raised from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. The first thing is God's power has been demonstrated. He can do it. The second thing is, is that God's power is available. It's available to you and I. We don't have to walk around believing that the world's just gonna take a two by four to our face time after time after time. Hey, look, you will have days where the two by four swings, okay? And we will have moments where our difficulty seems overwhelming, but God gives us strength even to face those things. You know that feeling when you look at other people's lives and you go, oh man, no wonder they're doing that. They're following Jesus because everything has ever gone their way. You know that feeling? And have you ever thought of it? Surely you had. You go, well, of course they follow Jesus because it's easy for them. You know why we're doing stories through the middle of this F8 Strong? is because we need to know that actually strength is built by encountering the living God in real moments. In my family, one great way God demonstrated his power was through our daughter-in-law, Heather, and through our son's life 
and what happened to them and what happened specifically to Heather while she was in Hawaii. Heather had a life-changing moment, literally a life-changing moment. Her, her and Isaac were playing sports at the University of Hawaii, living their lives, headed towards graduation, uh, having a great time out on the island, doing all these things. And then in the quick of an eye, their lives changed. I want you to hear Heather's story but I also want you to know this before you hear her story. Heather's sitting right over here. She's safe. She's healthy. She's all good. But you need to see her story and the way that it folded out in the national news. Now, with that amazing survival story caught on camera, a woman falling 50 feet down a waterfall in Hawaii and remarkably making it out alive. ABC's Gio Benitez is here with all of the details. Gio, good morning. Hey, Amy, good morning. Just incredible. She was hiking a popular trail in Honolulu when she got too close to that edge of the waterfall and slipped. The video is difficult to watch, but remember, she's now okay. And this morning, she's sharing her story right here. This was the moment that could have changed Whoa. everything for Heather Friesen. The 26 year old fallen ah! more than 50 feet down a Hawaiian waterfall. If you look again, you can see her body careen off nearly every rock on her way down, struggling to get her head above water, submerged for about 20 seconds. You can hear Heather clearly in pain. I couldn't breathe very well, and so I knew that something had to be wrong. Now, after recovering from a collapsed lung, 10 broken ribs, and a fractured scapula, Heather sits down with GMA. It's kind of that whole cliche, time slows down <laughs> as you're falling kind of thing. Luckily, she says, two hikers showed up to help at the bottom of that waterfall. I remember my vision getting a little blurry, but I just kept telling myself to take deep breaths. And, and just saying that I was going to be okay. There were actually two random hikers that came um, out of nowhere. One of the hikers happened to know an air evacuation crew. There was a random hiker who was on the hike who was best friends with the air evacuation crew. They were able to text the air evacuation crew our exact location so they could get there quicker. A life-saving text right there. Now, Heather says that even as she was falling, she just knew she wasn't going to die and that she was actually more worried about her friends and family who watched her fall. But thankfully, she didn't hit her head oh. because that's what could have killed her. There's a lot of oh. thankfullies yes, in that one. A lot. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. Wow. Hikers being there yep. with this right number and everything. That text. Incredible story. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Gio. The story I'll be sharing with you today is a crazy one as you can see from the video we just watched. It's amazing to me how one moment and one wrong step can change your life forever. I called it both the worst day and the best day of my life. And while there was pain, fear, devastation, and shock, I knew who held my life. And I still know today who holds my life. It is my prayer that before you leave here today, you will know that there's a God who loves you more than you could ever imagine. You will know that he desires to give you the strength that you need to get through all the battles in this life. And I pray that when you leave here today, it won't be the crazy story of a girl falling off a waterfall that you can't forget, but that it will be all about God and how you can't wait to tell people about him. I want to start with just a little background on my life and where I'm from. I'm from the Chicago area originally and from a small town called Munster in northwest Indiana. I uh, was born, in the same, born and raised in the same house my whole life. And I was also born and raised Catholic. And I was a very devout Catholic. So I was an altar server. I would go serve with the priest at Mass. Um, I would go up and read as a lector. I sang in the choir, would go to church multiple times a week. And I loved it. I was very religious, as you could say. But I think for me, I didn't really understand what a true relationship with God was. So also growing up, we were a very big sports family. And I like to say that my first love was softball. That's why my husband and I get along well, because he's a baseball player. <laughs> But as you can also tell, I'm tall, and my older sister, she encouraged me to play volleyball. So I, I tried out for a club team, and I ended up making it, and it kind of just all went from there. So I developed this new love for volleyball, and um, I didn't realize it as I was growing up, but volleyball became an idol in my life. And it was just something that was above everything else. 
and I didn't, it wasn't God first, it was definitely my sport first. And when I was doing really well, when we had a great match, I was happy. If we did terribly, then I was just super angry. So it controlled my emotions and my thoughts. I was blessed though to get a scholarship to play at Western Kentucky University. And my time there was amazing. We had a, a terrific coach who's like a second father to me. Um, we just had lots of success as a team, so it was, it was just a really great time. Going into my senior season there, I decided that I wanted to play a fifth year in a different sport, and beach volleyball is considered a different sport. So um, I emailed every single school that had a beach volleyball program and kind of just waited to hear back. And somehow, miraculously, the University of Hawaii emailed me back. <laughs> And you have to understand, I know that we're farther west here in Idaho, but being from Chicago, Hawaii was like this far off land to me that no one ever goes to. So I told people I was going to Hawaii and they were just shocked and I was too, but a couple of months later I was on a flight on the way to Hawaii for my first time. So I got there and I was instantly humbled because beach volleyball is very different from indoor volleyball. So there was a lot that I had to learn, but I've always, been known to be a hard worker, so I was determined just to work my butt off and to uh, at least be on the travel team for that season. So I did, I worked really hard, and um, when the season started, I was on the travel team, and I was really happy about that. But we went through the rest of the season, and I had one season left the next year. And so this time, I was determined I was gonna be on that number one team. So once again, worked really, really hard, was playing volleyball multiple times a day, and about two weeks before our season was set to start, my coaches put me with the best girl on the team. And so I had made it. I was on that top team and I was so excited, like happy for myself with the work that I had put in. We had a chance to win a national championship that year, so I was just, I was ready and yeah, just really ready to go. And then exactly a week before our season was set to start, I decided to go on this hike. I was with a group of friends. Uh, my boyfriend then, who is now my husband, wasn't with us because he was in California on a road trip. But we were hiking for about an hour, and then we come up to the top of this waterfall. And I had my GoPro strapped to my chest, so I turned my GoPro on. And you can see in the video, there was this little trickle of water that was kind of in the shadows that I didn't really see, and my foot just stepped right on it and came out from under me. So I started falling down this 40 to 50 foot waterfall. And I hit the bottom, and it, once I came up from the water, I just remember thinking, okay, I can't breathe very well. And my main thought was, I just want to get to the hospital to find out what's wrong with me. So I had to lay there for about 40 minutes to wait for a helicopter to come get me because I couldn't walk out. My friends couldn't carry me. But it was during those minutes that some amazing things happened, and you can't deny the presence of God in those moments. So I really want to share with you um, these four moments. There are many others, but these things are just incredible. And I just want them to encourage you and let you know that God was showing his love for me and, and he has that same love for each and every one of us. But during these 40 minutes, first of all, there was a random hiker on the hike who was best friends with the air evacuation crew. And so he texted them our exact location so that they could get there quicker. So that was a blessing. Then there was someone with us on the hike who had to leave early by himself, and he was on his way back. He told me this later when I was in the hospital. He said he didn't know why, but he just got this feeling like he needed to stop and pray for us. So he got down on his knees right there and just started praying for us, and then found out later what had happened and realized that was why he felt that prompting. And then as I was laying there, the helicopter was almost there. I could, hear, I could hear it in the distance. And all of a sudden, I see this big group of my friends from the Christian church that I was going to at that time show up. So they just so happened to be on the hike on the same day at the exact same time. <laughs> they had no idea that I was going on that hike that day. But I saw them, and they saw me, and they just instantly started praying for me. And that was just such a needed comfort in that moment. So God is just sending people to be there for me and to pray for me and just has his hand on this whole situation. There were people that have fallen from this waterfall before and they've hit their head and died instantly. But God was protecting me. So the helicopter gets there and then they put me in this cage that's attached to a rope to the helicopter. So they don't even take me up into the helicopter for this helicopter ride. So I'm just hanging there 
And I remember being really scared at first. So I'm being lifted up and all these branches are hitting me in the face. Pretty frightening. But then as soon as I'm lifted through the trees, I remember being greeted by the warmth of the sun. And I had been so cold because I was sitting there in that water for those 40 minutes. And it was just such a welcome greeting. And I kid you not that this moment, this helicopter ride was the most peaceful moment of my life because I felt God's presence with me in a way that I never had before to this day. And I just kept repeating to myself over and over again, God's got me, I know I'm gonna be okay. The thought never crossed my mind that I was going to die and I, I just knew that I was gonna play volleyball again. And so I just relied on that hope and that strength that God was giving me in this peaceful moment before everything just got crazy again. So they took me to the ambulance, which gave me a ride to the hospital. And when I got there, I found out that I had 10 broken ribs, my left lung collapsed, and I fractured my scapula, my shoulder blade on the left side. Now this was just really devastating news. And I also had to have surgery to get my ribs plated because they were so out of place. So I have five plates and about 60 screws holding my ribs together. What's funny is that when I was falling, I remember telling myself, okay, Heather, you need to land on your left side because you're right-handed and you don't want to mess up your hitting shoulder. <laughs> I kid you not, I had that thought. So I did, I landed on my left side and all the damage was there and the doctor, when he told me I had to have surgery, told me, you have to do this if you want a chance at playing volleyball again because my lung capacity was going to be very decreased by the way my ribs were pressing on my lung. So we did the surgery. I was in the hospital for about two weeks and then the days and the months after that accident were the hardest times in my life. There was, there was so much pain, both literally and figuratively, and just so much devastation. But God really used that time to grow my relationship with him and made me realize that I needed to keep him as the center of my life. So there was one day, I don't know why, but I was having a particularly bad day that day. And so I was laying down to bed at night and I just needed to have some encouragement from God. So I got my phone and I started typing in Psalm 37, which is a pretty popular Psalm. But my finger slipped a little and I typed in 73 instead. And I'd never heard of this Psalm before, but I just decided, okay, I'm gonna read this because you put this in front of me, Lord. So I start, I start reading with the first verses, and this is how it starts. It says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So here I was a month or two after I had just slipped and fallen off a waterfall, and God is putting the scripture in front of me about feet slipping. <laughs> so he instantly got my attention, and I said, okay, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to read the rest and see what you have for me. So the middle of the psalm goes on to talk about how we see and we envy these people who have success and fame and fortune, and, and we want what they have, but we realize they're not, they're not walking with God. And we don't understand why we as Christians and people that are walking with God, we go through this pain and suffering and, and have to endure this when the people that don't have God are having success. And that's how I was feeling in this moment. So it really spoke to me and God got my attention and finally made me realize that volleyball was an idol in my life. That I was putting volleyball above everything else and I was just worried about the, the fame of that and not worried about my relationship with God. And I wanna read the last verses of this Psalm too, verses 23 to 28. The Psalmist says, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So those are some pretty powerful words and they really hit me in my heart. 
And I realized that I needed to give everything up to God and just stop complaining about where I was. And I know and I realize that we as Christians have hope and will not perish. John MacArthur did a really great commentary on this psalm, and I want to share with you some of his thoughts. He says, The psalmist confesses his sin of evaluating his life secularly and faithlessly. But I know that we must find strength by living spirit-filled and faithful lives, the opposite of that. I was really encouraged by this and think that this is what God is calling us to as Christians. Another thing that John MacArthur shares is that the psalmist concludes that those who abandon God and attempt to live an autonomous life based on self-chosen idols will eventually endure eternal death. Now those are some harsh words also, but it's the truth. And I realized after reading this psalm that God just wanted to transform my life and he wanted to give me that spirit-filled and faithful life that I was missing out on. So you might say, okay, that's great. I know that I can get my strength from God and I want to do that, but how can I do that? And for me, there were four things that I really kind of dove into that helped me develop that relationship with God. And a few of them are pretty basic, but they're, they're really what we need to do as Christians. And so the first thing that I dove into was prayer. Just spending more time with God. I realize that it's okay to tell him that I'm frustrated, that I'm in pain. He wants to hear those things as my father. The second thing was reading the word of God. I hadn't done much of that growing up, and I like to use uh, just the comparison of thinking about our significant other or our spouse or just a best friend that we have that we really love. If we think about our relationship with them, we think about how we love to spend time with them, we want to hang out with them, we want to be around them, and we want to get to know them. And I want us to think about how that translates to our relationship with God, because God should be our number one relationship in our life. So if, if we think all those things about the people here that we really love, then how much more should we think those things about God, our Heavenly Father? The other thing that I think really makes a difference is fellowship. Spending time with other Christians and just being held accountable and getting to be lifted up by others is super important. Now this last one I think is the hardest one, and that is telling others about God and what he's done in our lives. Verse 28 says, I will tell of all your deeds. And I really think that that was God's call on my life, and I think it's God's call on all of our lives as well as Christians. Going back to the relationship comparison, if you think about when you first started dating someone who might be your spouse or just someone you're really excited about, you're going on these awesome dates. And like when I was dating Isaac, I was having a great time and I just wanted to tell everyone, right? You're so giddy and you just, just want to let everyone know about this new relationship that you're in. And I think we need to be like that with God. We need to think about how he's transformed our lives and just want to tell everyone about him and the amazing things that he's done. And when we do that, he gives us the strength that we need. He gives us the boldness and the courage to just be able to stand up in front of others and say, this is what God has done in my life. So I want to encourage you all with these four things, and they really transformed my life and my relationship with God. I ended up getting baptized about eight months after my accident happened in the Hawaiian Ocean, and it was just an amazing time of being able to publicly proclaim my faith in God and say, God, I don't know what you have for me, but all I know is that I want to do your will above everything else. Now, I, I just truly believe that these four things that I shared with you today are the epitome of a spirit-filled and faithful life. And I just encourage you that they will help transform each and every one of your lives as well, just as they did mine. I hope that none of you all have fallen off a waterfall like I did. <laughs> but I know that each and every one of us, we have those waterfall moments in our lives. We have those moments where something tragic happens and we need to rely on God for strength instead of ourselves. And those moments really can draw us closer to God. And we need to use those moments to find strength in him. 
Like I said at the beginning, I pray that when you leave here, you won't just remember my crazy story about falling off a waterfall, but I really pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you can discover the strength that God has for you. Thank you so much. We look, at, we look at other people's lives and we see the great things going on in their world and we think we're the ones that are the only ones that are struggling. Everyone around us here has a waterfall moment. Everyone around here, here with us, has our difficult moments. I remember that weekend, Isaac texted us that, that day when it happened and he said, hey, just please pray, pray for Heather. So we prayed for Heather. Uh, he was, they were playing at the University of San Francisco that day. Uh, talk with him a little bit later. And then here in his life, here he is worried about Heather. She's, she's 3,000 miles away out in Hawaii, sitting in a hospital room. And the next day, his coach calls him up and he comes in a relief to pitch. Okay? So when we think it's so hard, just remember there might even be one other person in your life who's also walking that difficult time with you and they're still asked to keep going as well. Where do we get that strength? We get that strength from God alone. You can get it from all kinds of other stuff, machismo, your attitude, your bravado, you know, your, your arrogance, your wealth, your looks, your whatever. But I will tell you this, all those fall short on the days that really matter. There was a great thing that happened and Heather told you in her story. And that is, is that in, in her life, she had known God and she had heard about God, and she had been walking in God, and she had grown up in a devout family. And, and, and praise God, Greg and Kathy, a part of her life, sharing God's love and life with them. On that day, there was a Job moment in Heather's life. In Job 42, verse 5, here's what Job says about his experience when he had his moments. Job 42, 5 says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. The Apostle Paul prayed this, that the eyes of your understanding, that your spiritual eyes would be opened and enlightened. This morning, God is on offer to you. Those of you who are out there online watching as well, whether in the house, I mean, what a crowd we have here in the house this morning, celebrating and worshiping our God. That God is there to help us through these wretched and difficult times. No matter what is going on, hear me on this. We do not live in fear. I have fears. You have fears. I have worries. You have worries. I have concerns. You have concerns. But hear me on this. The strength of God allows us to not live in fear, to not live in worries, to not live in concerns. We address them holding on to the great hand of God. That's how we walk in this faith. And that's how we this little humble family right here, how we have, when we faced our waterfall moments, we have held out, reached out for the living God. I pray you're doing that as well. I pray you're doing that as well. And may you know that the God you, the, who made you is right out there waiting for you to reach out to him as well. Today is Father's Day. May you fathers be blessed, encouraged, and celebrated. We're going to go out to Dad Fest here in a minute. We're going to see whether those, sh those shots of Pastor Doug actually hitting the target with the axe really was staged, or maybe he did it. Right now, I don't know, but we're about to go find out. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Our son Isaac is going to come lead us in a closing prayer here in just a moment. For those of you who are out there watching online, those discussion questions are a blessing for you. May the Lord be with you.